Welcome to our Sound for Video session. It's the 3rd of March, 2018. Question and answer session today. Let's dive right in. Apologize for my voice up front. I am recovering from what I think was the flu, um, but the show must go on, so let's dive in. First of all, a question from Steve. I'm confused as to the time code settings on the Zoom F4, F8. I use the Zoom as the master clock and regularly jam. For example, a Canon C300, Sony FS7, Ambient Locket Slate and or Aria Alexa for the, from the Zooms. With this workflow, I am defaulting to setting the system date, time, RTC to time of day, so on and so forth. You can read the rest of that if you like. I didn't understand Steve's question at first, so I clarified with him. I think what he was trying to do was, Steve, were you trying to make it so that when you set things up and you got everything jammed in the morning, then at lunchtime you shut everything down. When you come back uh, after lunch, was there a way to turn the Zoom back on and not have to re-jam sync everything? And the answer, unfortunately, with the Zoom is no. You do have to re-jam everything. So that's just not a feature that the Zoom has. The Sound Devices 633 has a feature where you kind of go into a relatively low power mode where it keeps the time code clock going. Some people complained about that not working. I don't know. I generally just turn mine off and re-jam or I just leave it on. Um, so... Uh, sorry, that's not better news, but uh, <laughs> that's my understanding with how the Zoom F4 and F8 work and time code. All right, next up from Paul. How do you get crispy, clear audio while shooting with a smartphone, filmmaking, and regular cameras in an industrial area? Well, let's be careful with uh, this term crispy. <laughs> if you're talking a uh, sound that's like it was recorded in a sound isolated and treated studio. I don't know that that's possible in industrial areas that are noisy. However, um, here is an example where I used a reporter's microphone to record on the show floor at NAB last year, uh, talking with Paul Isaacs here at Sound Devices. Um, this, there is still some background noise, but you can definitely hear both of us. I'll go ahead and put a link for this video and you can hear what it sounds like. The nice thing about this setup, this is a Rode Reporter microphone. I'll put a link for that. And then this is also the Rode iXLR. This can connect to your smartphone or... Uh, actually, it only connects to your smartphone. Um, but what we shot with here is I recorded the audio to my smartphone, which is sitting right here on the desk. And then my brother was shooting the camera, and we just synced them up later in post. So you can do it either way. A reporter's microphone... Um, is a good way to do this from the standpoint that it is a dynamic microphone. So it's not very good at picking up sounds that, uh, well, it, it, it takes fairly strong sound pressure levels to, to be able to register that sound. So it's only going to pick up stuff that's relatively close to it. Um, so that's how it is able to work pretty well in an industrial area where there's lots of other surrounding noise. Um, you can also, this one is an omnidirectional, you can also get cardioid microphones. Those are a little bit more sensitive in terms of where you hold them. You may have to hold them a little closer towards each person, person's mouth as they talk, but they're a little more directional, so you get a, a, some more benefit there as well. Um, you can also use uh, ear-worn microphones. These are little microphones that hang from a holder on your ear. Um, sometimes those can work really well in those types of circumstances as well. So hopefully that helps, Paul. Um, oh, there also is, a, I did do a piece uh, a while back, if you do search on YouTube for Curtis Judd Audio and Voice Technologies, um, there is a, an ear-worn microphone that we reviewed a while back. All right, next up from Brian. Managing data, assigning scratch disks, and what considerations should you take into account when trying to optimize working with Adobe Audition? Well, fine question. Let's take a look here. We're going to come back to that. If you come into our preferences here, um, what I do, my system setup is, I don't know if it's unique from most other people, but what I have is I have an external RAID drive that stores all of my working files. And then, of course, the computer has its internal drive. And I generally put the scratch on my internal drive, and then I do all the work on the other files on my external drive. Um, you can, I don't really know the answer to this, in short. <laughs> um, I have never had any performance issues that I've experienced, even when I've been uh, mixing larger jobs like uh, films. So I haven't had any problems with that. But it's something that I, I guess I need to look into a little bit more um, to get you a better answer. In terms of memory, 
my system's got 32 gigs and I allocate 14 to audition and I leave 18 for everything else. Um, Multi-track, um, this is an important setting that we'll come to a little bit later in today's session. I would also make sure you set the panning mode uh, to minus 3 dB center, not left-right cut. All right. Thanks for that, Brian. Uh, next question is from Roman. I have questions related to the new Adobe Audition 2018. What are your thoughts on the new dynamic module? Well, let's just pull that up here. It's right here. So the dynamics module is a combination of a sort of an automated gate, a compressor, an expander, and a limiter. Um, I don't use gates a whole lot. I use a breath control from Isotope, but um, these kind of these can be used to do this a similar type thing to reduce breaths in between phrases, but they're really kind of persnickety and they're they're difficult to use for that from my point of view. Other people disagree with me, and that's fine. Um, if you want to use them, use them. I can't. <laughs> I'm not an expert at these, so don't. Uh, I, I can't tell you a whole lot more. Um, other than that's generally what these are for. So the auto gate gives you the opportunity to set the attack, the threshold, the release, and the hold. And what this does is it once the amplitude of the waveform falls beneath a certain point, it will actually reduce the amplitude even more. So it is making the somewhat quiet parts even quieter, if you will. That's the same thing that the expander does, except this expander is very simple. It just has a threshold and a ratio. The compressor is uh, pretty basic. Um, it does have a threshold, ratio, attack, release, and makeup gain. So we've done a lot of tutorials on how to use these. This one is no different. Um, it does not have a soft knee. Um, it doesn't have some of the other fancier features you find on some fancier compressors, but it does seem very capable and it sounds fine to my ear. So I think that's a fine piece of uh, plug-in to use. And then of course there's a limiter. Unfortunately, I don't believe this is a true peak limiter which is unfortunate to do uh, true peak limiting in Audition. You have to come up here to hard limiter and choose true peak. So it would have been nice if they had put this in the new dynamics module, but unfortunately I don't believe they did. Um, so those are, those are some thoughts on the new dynamics module. Oh, your question also was, uh, can it be paired with Isotope RX-6? I spent about 15 minutes trying to do that in Isotope when you open up a plugin, you can actually choose any plugins that are installed on the system, but it doesn't look like you can use the native Audition plugins. Like I could get all of them except for those. So I don't know how to make that work. I, I, I suspect that Audition doesn't like you to do that or Adobe doesn't like you to do that. So I didn't see a way to do that, unfortunately. So um, that's unfortunate news. All right. Very good. Thanks, Roman, for the question on that one. Next up from Brad. Some projects I deliver get shown in live venues, theaters, churches, etc., and I am frequently disappointed with my mix as far as music versus dialogue goes. If I mix the music down a little more than I think it should be, it often gets lost and barely audible. If I mix a little higher, I think it's in the way. I know all music, all voices, and all venues are different, but are there theories on rough targets for the number of dBs less music should be from dial? dialogue. I've heard 10 dB less is a good starting place, but not sure if that's true. Um, yeah, I think 10 is a fine start. Let's, um, I have a, an older episode I'd like to refer you to, and I'll put a link for this below. Um, this is a piece where we did uh, talking specifically about this mixing music behind dialogue. I think the secret is it's not a certain number of decibels in and of itself. Um, really what you need to do is you need to EQ the music. Um, so you need to create a sort of a trough in the music with EQ so that you cut out some of those middle frequencies where most of the dialogue lives. And that way the dialogue and the music aren't competing with each other so much. So they can live side by side and you can hear both of them. So go ahead and follow this tutorial. And I think that'll get you a lot closer to where you want to be. Okay. Thanks for the question, Brad. All right, next up. Uh, regularly use Adobe Audition and Isotope RX6 Advanced for my audio post-production workflow. I edit with Adobe Premiere. When I process audio files in Audition, I often use match loudness and try to have similar loudness levels of all audio clips during editing in Premiere. I notice that the audio files imported to Premiere are quieter than in Audition. The loudness level is different and always lower by a few dB. To double check this, I exported some sequences from Premiere with no loudness processing except uh, during export 
And when audio is imported back to Audition, it is clearly quieter than original. Um, is it an issue or am I doing something wrong? That's a good question. I, um, I do not use Premiere. I have to confess, and I have not for probably three years. So I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. And I don't, um, I don't know the, I, I probably just needed to direct you over to Adobe support. So if you go to helpx.adobe.com and ask for, you know, contact support, um, and then walk through that, they should be able to help you narrow that down. I apologize that I don't um, have the answer to that, uh, but hopefully they can get you all sorted out and, and get things working for you. Um, that's where the, when, when, when we did look at the pan law, when we were over here, I would check this. This is worth checking. Um, if you come under preferences and multi-track, make sure that your default panning mode is set to minus three dB center. If it's set to left right cut, that could be part of what you're experiencing. Um, so that is one thing you can check. Um, you have, you're recording a podcast for a couple of years, an hour and a half long, two to three individual tracks. Since it's a weekly show, I try to optimize the time I spend on editing the podcast as much as possible. Completely understand that's a long edit. <laughs> I use Isotope Editor to prepare tax, tracks before adding them to Logic Pro for editing and mixing. Ever since I realized what compression is, I struggle to apply the right amount of it to each individual track, not with compressor, compressor options, but with the actual amount. And when I look at the bounce track in Isotope to compress some peaks and normalize loudness, sometimes I see visual compression difference between the individual parts of the mix. I'd like to come up with a simple rule that would help me to quickly decide what level of compression to apply and achieve similar levels for each track in the final mix. I'm just an enthusiast and I don't always hear the difference between right and wrong compression. I'd rather need some visual rules. Well, I would say, um, first of all, I wouldn't necessarily do compression on each individual track. I would uh, do the mix <clears throat> and then in the mix, you're going to be normalizing, you're going to be changing the levels of the individual speakers overall so that they generally match. And then you'll do your compression on the on the final mix, potentially. That's, that's one way to get around this issue here. If you're compressing each individual track, especially if they're cut into pieces, um, you're going to have a kind of a mess on your hands, or it's going to be probably a little bit harder to work with, potentially. Um, so, or you could, you know, if you want to spend that time, you can do that. But again, you're, you're, I think, struggling to get consistent results. So I would say do the mix, do a stereo mix down, and then apply the compression to the stereo mix down. Or what you can do is in Audition, if you come into multi-track here, let's just go ahead and create one. You can apply the compressor on the master track here instead of the individual tracks. So... That can save you a lot of try time and avoid some of those inconsistencies from track to track. So hopefully that makes sense and hopefully that simplifies matters for you a little bit. Mike asks, I'm going to be creating a large number of training videos with about 10% using a talking head format, the other 90% being a screen recording format with voiceovers. From a quality perspective, what would you recommend I use a lavalier for the talking head with a large diaphragm for the screen recordings? Or should I use a single high quality shotgun for both? I don't know that I have a strong opinion. I think it, I guess it depends. I assume that the number one goal for you is to, to get consistent sound between the talking head and the screen recordings. So if that's the case, it would be ideal to probably use the same microphone. Um, then I would ask the question about, you know, for example, I've seen a lot of uh, educational type pieces where, you know, where they, they start with a talking head um, and they're just using the large diaphragm or whatever microphone they're using, a dynamic microphone. Um, while the instructor is sitting there at the computer. So you're seeing their face, not the computer. And um, that format works pretty well, and you get very consistent sound, of course, because they're using the same exact microphone. So that's a thought there worth considering. Um, or you can also do EQ matching. So if you want to get two microphones to sound like each other, Isotope RX has a, an EQ match that works incredibly well. And literally, you just bring in... Um, uh, I'm not really prepared to demonstrate that here today, um, but there's this EQ match module here. And essentially what you do is you learn, you, you open up both files here, you click learn from the file that you want the other one to sound like, and then you go back and apply the processing to the first file. And that makes them, it EQs the first one so it sounds like the second one. So that's a pretty neat way to do it. You can of course always do it manually, 
by using your ear and applying an EQ to the uh, track you want to make sound like the other one. So those are kind of the main ideas. I would try to stick with the same microphone, though, if you can. That will make things a lot easier. So good luck, Mike. Sounds like a fun project. And then finally, a question from Gene. Just a quick question. I think I hear a lot of people talking about the fact that there is no advantage to record anything at settings above 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit. I record everything at 96 kilohertz, 24-bit. One thing I haven't heard anyone say is if there is any disadvantage to the higher sample rates and bit depth other than greater file size. Okay, first of all, Gene, this is I found this, interestingly, to be a highly inflammatory topic. I don't know why people get so uh, tied up about this. Um, but I can say this about my own ears. I generally cannot tell the difference in sample rates between 44.1, 48, and 96 kilohertz recordings. Um, however, I always record 24-bit when I can just to have that extra processing latitude when I'm in post. I guess the one argument that some people would make, um, actually there is, a, there is a case I think definitely where larger sample rates may be useful, and that is if you're going to do some heavy processing, including slowing down um, some audio. So if you're going to slow its overall pace, um, you have additional samples to work with there. So that can be a really helpful scenario. Um, however, um, I don't really see a lot of other advantages. The only advantage I could see someone potentially pointing out, and I don't know if I agree with this or not, but that is that when you deliver your final piece, if you're, say, for example, uploading a, a video online, that video audio rate for most standards either needs to be 48 kilohertz or 44.1. So that means you're going to have to resample 96 kilohertz down to 44.1 or 48. Probably makes most sense to go to 48 since it's half of 96. Um, but in that process of resampling, um, some people get very persnickety about which uh, types of resampling algorithms they use and claim they can hear a difference. Um, again, I don't, I don't know. I haven't done a lot of that. So um, I would say from my, from my point of view, Gene, for all practical purposes, I don't really see a disadvantage other than using a little bit more file space. So if you're happy with the results you're getting, I'd stick with it. All right. That is our Sound for Video session for today. hope that was helpful for you. Sorry, some of those questions I couldn't actually answer, but I hopefully we've got you pointed in the right direction to get the information you need. Get out there and make some great sound. We'll talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.